Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's my honour today to rise in this House and talk about Bill C-42, money laundering, a short description. Canadians would be surprised to know that, aside from the soft reputation our country has on the international scene, Canada is increasingly known as a popular safe haven for criminals to launder and hide their money. In 2022, Canada ranked 14th on Transpar Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, with a score of 74 out of 100. Canadians would be in their right mind to ask why our country's score isn't higher, especially since this lack of transparency problem has been known for a long time, for the past seven years, to be exact. People will remember that in 2016, the Panama Papers leak exposed the fact that international criminals had been exploiting the gaps in Canada's corporate beneficial ownership regulatory scheme to engage in corrupt conduct through federally, provincially and territorially administered corporations. That same year, the Financial Action Task Force, which acts as the world's international money laundering watchdog, warned Canada that it was being used as a safe haven for money laundering and that a registry was needed to help identify and crack down on this activity. Yet since then, under this government, Canada has been slow to act, and when it did, it failed to go far enough. It took until 2018 for the Liberal government to begin introducing requirements to increase transparency around who exerts significant control over corporations and assets in this country. In 2021, the Financial Action Task Force indicated that Canada had made improvements but remained only a partially compliant in five areas and wholly non-compliant in one. Laundered money was still able to find its way into our country, no questions asked. And now here we are in 2023, introducing measures that are long overdue to tackle a problem that should have been dealt with years ago by this government. Fortunately or unfortunately for Canadians, while the Liberals were in no hurry to tackle the issue of money laundering throughout all those years, it has had a very real and devastating impact on a sector of our economy that affects everyone, one that keeps being mentioned extensively as of late. I'm referring to the housing market, Mr. Speaker. Since this government took office, the price of a home in Canada has doubled, leading citizens across the country to give up on the dream of home ownership. The situation is dire. Seven in ten Canadians now believe owning a home is financially reserved for those that are wealthy. Part of this phenomenon of housing growing increasingly out of reach for Canadians is explained by criminals using real estate as a vehicle to launder their money in Canada. This is enabled by the fact that Canada's anti-money laundering compliance regime is itself least compliant with international standards when it comes to supervising real estate agents and identifying the buyers of property. For young Canadians looking to start a home and a family, this pushes prices up and puts their dreams of home ownership further out of reach. And why? Partly because they have to compete against criminals who wish to use real estate to hide their dirty money, supply and demand. The situation is especially problematic in British Columbia. In 2018, the province launched the expert panel on money laundering and real estate. That panel estimated that in BC alone, more than $7 billion in dirty money was laundered across the economy in 2018, and that up to $5.3 billion of that money was laundered through real estate market, raising housing prices by an estimated 5%. It's no secret that housing is exceptionally unaffordable in cities like Vancouver, and criminal activity plays a non-negligible part in aggravating the situation. The situation is so dire that the number of British Columbians moving to Alberta reached a 20-year high in 2021-22. And for most, the main reason was affordability. Alberta is proud of its strong economy, one that welcomes Canadians from across the country with open arms and offers opportunity and affordability to its citizens. But due to the Liberals' weak approach to money laundering in Canada, the problem that plagued British Columbians now is following them across the Rocky Mountains. Calgary, the city I represent here in Parliament, is now also being used as a hub for the criminal network of money laundering groups 
that has grown across Canada under this government. Now, I knock a lot of doors in elections in Calgary Centre. I knock doors between elections. When I go into the large condos that have been recently developed, sometimes I'll find a condo where half the doors are empty. Nobody lives there, and yet they're all sold. There's been a lot of construction in Calgary, a lot of vacant suites, and yet there's nobody living in these buildings. And it is quite clear that those are foreign ownership, owners buying that property. Whether that's legitimate foreign ownership because people are actually moving their money out of where they live and want to make sure they have some safety elsewhere, or whether it's connected with the criminal intents that have also increased the uh, illicit activity of drug, uh, drug, drug addiction in Calgary is another question entirely. It's a mix between the two, Madam Speaker, and that is something we need to address here going forward. My constituents are particularly concerned about it because the effects it has across society, not just on the housing market. But housing is only one part of the problem. The broader issue at hand is the fundamental question of who owns what in this country. Are Canadian assets held by hardworking and law-abiding Canadians or criminals using it as a means to engage in offshore money laundering? As someone who worked in the financial industry for decades, I understand the importance of transparency and accountability, two things that currently lack when it comes to the ownership of assets in this country. In last year's budget, the government committed to finally implementing a national public registry by the end of 2023, ahead of the previously committed 2025. But this acceleration of the timeline in the Liberals' agenda was not prompted by the housing affordability crisis and its heart-wrenching impact on Canadians. Rather, it was the public concern about the misuse of nominee and corporate ownership by Russian oligarchs that lead to the acceleration of this timeline. That is why I support this bill, but I also believe that it should be more ambitious in its reach right now, as opposed to when the next international crisis forces the government to act. The fact remains that we are perceived internationally as having weak laws to combat money laundering and the proceeds of crime. Our Five Eyes partners, See us as a laggard on corporate transparency. This is why Conservatives not only support the additional me measures being introduced by Bill C-42, but also call on the government to do a number of things. Let me say that I'll interject here and talk about my experience. I acted in the financial industry for years. I actually represented uh, a number of investors that had their money laundered through a bunch of different vehicles, and that was a manipulation of the legal process by several parties involved. This happens all the time in Canada. The laws are set at now. I know that since the 2001, 9-11 uh, and 2001, the government tried to get more uh, transparency through the legal mechanisms, the legal profession to try and make sure they disclosed when they had transactions coming into their accounts of 10,000 or more, and that was overturned by the Supreme Court of Canada in 2015, that this, in fact, lawyers had the right to, in fact, withhold that information from governments. And what I've seen personally, Mr. Speaker, is that those lawyers give good advice on how to launder money through accounts in Canada, whether it's offshore accounts or whether it's Canadian uh, quasi-criminals, if you will. Tough to call them that until they've actually been convicted. But this is a direct... Uh, experience I've had. So the things we need to do, of course, is change the offences outlined in the bill and the existing offences under the Canada Business Corporations Act from summary convictions to criminal code offences. This would rank money laundering on par with the most serious offences under the criminal code in Canada, as it should. Change the threshold for significant interest at which disclosure is required from 25 per cent control of shares to 10 per cent. This is a threshold already used by the Ontario Securities Commission for public disclosure requirements. Reducing the currently suggested threshold would further reduce the ability of criminals to hide their activities. Clarify the degree of back-end access to the Registry of Law Enforcement in relation to the proceeds of crime and money laundering. Under the bill right now, in its current form, law enforcement as well as the Financial Transactions and Reports Analysis Center, FinTrack, would require an affidavit to assess all of the information contained in the registry.
That's about it, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the time. I have much more to say, but I know my time is limited. Thank you very much. Question and commentary, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Fleetwood, Port Cowles. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was uh, fascinated to hear uh, the Honourable Member talk about uh, some of the transactions uh, between lawyers, because we know that transactions between uh, lawyers' trust accounts uh, aren't captured by FinTrack. Um, is he strongly, uh, you know, in favour of, of of changing that? And the other thing I'd ask him to comment on is the uh, beneficial ownership of broadcast outlets in Canada, because uh, you know there are concerns about uh, Chinese meddling, and, and uh, we've we've heard at least anecdotally that uh, their control over radio and television and cable stations, uh, if it isn't ownership, it's certainly something else. But is that also worth a, a closer look uh, in connection with this bill? Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. I thank my colleague for the important question. Uh, I won't address the, the Broadcasting Act because I'm not sure that should be covered here or should be covered in a different bill, but I will address what he talked about, about lawyers' trust accounts. Lawyers' trust accounts aren't held to the same standard as financial transactions. I remember in the financial industry, if $10,000 in cash came into your account, you had to, find, you had to report that to the FinTrack authorities immediately. If, if you're at a brokerage, $1,000 of cash was actually the hurdle, your money laundering actually happens at things like uh, cur currency exchanges where people walk in with a thousand bucks and they'll actually exchange $999 and effectively make it that way. So we do need to include the trust from lawyers in here. Uh, we'll watch them fight it again in the Supreme Court, but making sure that we actually bring them under the umbrella of what's acceptable for money laundering mechanisms in Canada is very important. Thank you. L'honorable député pour à Joliet. Merci, M. le Président. Je remercie l'honorable collègue pour son discours très intéressant. Je pense qu'on partage pas mal la même vision sur ce projet de loi-ci. Dans euh, le discours de sa collègue juste avant, la députée de Sarnia Lampton, pour, pour illustrer comment ce gouvernement a fait pas assez, elle a rappelé le scandale des Panama Papers. Dans ce scandale-là, juste rappeler quelques chiffres à cette Chambre. Alors que le gouvernement se vante d'en faire beaucoup, l'Agence du revenu a recouvré moins d'argent que ce qu'a recouvré Revenu Québec. Et pour donner une idée de comparaison, le Royaume-Uni a recouvré plus de 317 millions, l'Allemagne 246 millions, l'Espagne 209 millions, la France 179 millions, l'Australie 173 et le Canada 21 millions, donc 10 fois moins que, que les autres. Est-ce que l'honorable collègue est d'accord avec moi pour dire que ce gouvernement doit en faire beaucoup plus que ce qu'il fait actuellement? Merci, M. le Président. Honourable member for Calgary Centre. Uh, je, me, je remercie mon collègue pour la, la bonne question, mais il, il a raison. Uh, la faiblesse de la, de la Revenu Canada, c'est uh, épouvantable dans les, les, dans les affaires du monde maintenant. Mais tous les autres pays du monde ont indiqué qu'ils ont gagné plus d'argent, plus d'argent sable, si on dit, des, uh, des blanchissements de l'argent qui existent dans les, les, uh, les pays comme le Panama. Et, Je suis sûr qu'on euh, euh, on, on devrait euh, avoir un, un meilleur résultat de notre agence de revenu au Canada. Merci beaucoup. Time for a brief exchange. The Honourable Member for Nepean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the Honourable Member on the need to combat uh, money laundering, tax evasion. On the disclosure norms, uh, he, I think he mentioned that the threshold of 10 percent, he seems to agree with that. My question is that why should we have any threshold of any percentage before the uh, names of the whole shareholders be made public? It's very easy to overcome this sort of threshold. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Oh, that's, a, that's a good question, and I appreciate that very much. We should have a beneficial owner threshold that actually says who controls these companies, because a, lo a lot of them will be in separate nominated accounts that might have the same person behind them. But eventually we have to see our way to who those people are. So like my colleague I think is alluding to, if you have 11 people owning 9% of a corporation, none of those have full 10%. So in that case, that beneficial ownership should be quite clear that it's the same entities that control that corporation. So it is something that is right. We should capture making sure we're talking about beneficial ownership of at least you know 10% or more. 
There comes a point in time when you're just a passive investor, but 10%, you actually are a participant, in my opinion. Thank you.